Well, we wanted to uh, have somebody coming in here. Uh, welcome back. And uh, we're doing the Song of Songs, and we have not done the Song of Songs in a long time. Returning to the Song of Songs is also known as the Song of Solomon, which is a spiritual poem. And it portrays spirit in the guise of man and woman, uh, you know, male and female, a love affair uh, that, you know, is allegorically spun to talk about that which is the um, um, communion between spirit and mind. Let's look at page 576, and we're at Song of Songs chapter 6. There's only eight chapters in the entire book, so we're closing in on going through another one. I think we've done the book of Revelation, the book of Matthew. Before this next year is out, we will have completed the book of Genesis, which is significant, and had a good, you know, good shot at getting quite a bit into Exodus. Uh, in Song of Songs chapter 6, the question is put forth to you. Because regardless of what church you've been in or what religious experience that you've had, the desire of your heart is to find that which is spirit, to find that, you know, which is God. Song of Songs chapter 6, verse 1, Where is your beloved gone, fairest among women? Where is the divine power? And, and, and that's a question that each one of us have asked, and that's what you seek. Where is our beloved? You know, whether you be in a fundamentalist religion, if you be in some kind of a spiritual religion, people seek the occult, but it's all for the same thing. They're trying to find that which is the power that lies hidden beyond the ability of the normal senses to perceive it. So where is it? And so the question is asked in chapter 6, verse 1, where is your beloved gone? And it says, fairest among women. That's an interesting point because the woman represents that which is the spirit, the emotions, but in this particular case we're talking about in a higher realm not, rather than a lower carnal realm. So the, the, the question is asked to the spirit. So we question our spirit and question each other's spirit. And basically it is, where do we find this? We were talking this morning about, in the book of Exodus, and we were talking about the power, we were talking about the, the energy that is available to us, but, you know, we, each one of us still are searching. Is there something inside of us, really? Is there something on another planet? You know, people start talking about UFOs and things. Could these be of God? I mean, where is it? So, where is your beloved? And the interesting thing is, as we come together in meditation, or as we pray for one another, look at Chapter 6, verse 1, where is your beloved that we may seek him with you? That we may together seek for that which is the bridegroom in this case, God, Christ. Where is he? Where is she? Where is it? Where, you know, here we have been reading Bibles and reading holy books and singing hymns for 2,000 years, over 2,000 years, and nobody's seen Heidner. <laughs> Where are these people? Whatever they are, where are they? You know? 2,000 years. And we're, so, you know, we're supposed to have faith. And for 2,000 years, what has been the, 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 the theme? He's coming soon. <laughs> no. What, what, there is not a trace. So where is it? And maybe there is a trace. Maybe there is a dynamic that we can be very aware of, but we don't know what we're looking at. And we don't know how to see. Okay. If you want to see a particular constellation in, in the night sky and you look in the wrong direction, you're not going to see it. You have to look in the right direction. You have to know what you're looking for. So here then is the fact that the mind here is gravitating to the call of the bridegroom. We don't want to lose sight of this fact. This word bridegroom is very important, and that's the part being played in Song of Songs, because metaphysically in the Bible, the bridegroom is the word. And if you want to look at it, you can find it in Psalm 19. The bridegroom is a, is a metaphysical term in the Bible given to identify the sun. The sun in the sky. 
And I don't care, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm at this stage in my development, and it doesn't make any difference. I don't have to prove it to you. I don't require anybody to believe it. You know, it's irrelevant. For my own sake, I am completely 1,000% convinced that the entire scriptures are referring to the sun in the sky. And that we're talking about continued sun worship, because it is the author of all life. It is God's only begotten son. It is the light of the world, and it is the giver of life. And it's born on Christmas Day, and it dies on December 21st, it goes three days and three nights in the tomb, the whole bit. It's the sun, it is sun worship. And, and here we are going through the same sun worship because we didn't want to look like pagans, we put a name on it, called it by a name of a person, but yet people 50,000 years ago were doing the same thing as we are now. So, oh, they're all sun worshipers. <laughs> so are you. And then the one that's Jesus, he comes up in the book of Revelation, and he calls himself Amen, which is the name of the Egyptian sun god. So, I mean, I, I am willing to back off of this, but the Bible's going to have to be changed because they had no business putting all of this stuff in there if they didn't mean to lead us to believe this is the sun. This is the sun. There's no question it's the sun. But we're not going to go back into all the things we've been traipsing over and over and over. Although, you know, maybe this Sunday morning we might traipse over some of them, some of them because what I wanted to do, and I'll tell you why I'm doing it. I, I was going to do more Song of Songs Sunday morning, but I've got, the way the Exodus came out, I've got one half of a, an audio tape with nothing to put on it. I don't want to put Song of Songs in here, so we're going to do something special Sunday morning, which we'll, which we'll get together and we'll, you know, I'll come up with some ideas. And, and, you know, we always work those things come out right. So it'll be kind of fun and kind of exciting and kind of different for Sunday morning, but I think very, um, you know, um, enlightening. Okay. So we're going to seek the sun. Seek and you shall find. Okay. And, 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 and basically, this was the admonition of Jesus that we may seek and find the bridegroom. All right. Now, let's go back for just a moment and see what have we got here. We have a question asked of the Spirit, where is the Beloved? Okay? Where is God? Where is Christ? Is He on a planet somewhere? Is He in somebody's head? Is He under the chair? Is He in a church? And so forth. You know? I, I, there's a line I saw somewhere which I love because it talks about going to church is not necessarily necessary to become holy because mice live in churches all their lives and they're not necessarily holy people. But let's see what the answer is as to where is God? Where is this energy? Song of Songs chapter 6 verse 2, my beloved is gone down into his garden. That's where he is. Well, we've identified where the beloved, where this, this Christ, where God is, in the garden, okay? Now, we, we have to use the book, we have to use the scriptures to now take that word garden and see if we can maximize it and identify some things and at least get a, a, an idea as to where this garden is located. If you look on page 2 in your Bible, you go to Genesis chapter 2, the early part of the Bible, Genesis chapter 2, and then verse 8, and you see the Lord God planted a garden. And remember, the beloved has gone down into his garden. The Lord God planted a, a garden eastward in Eden. That's a key there. So the garden is planted in the east or getting down to the aspect of our own physical uh, human consciousness. The garden is at the right side. So then the scripture is saying the beloved or that which is the God essence that we seek is located at the right side. And that would be, you know, reminiscent, or not reminiscent, but that would be revealing to us to understand it's the right hemisphere of the brain. Now, that's one scripture that talks about the garden being in, in the right side, which would lead us to think, okay, eastward, it's in the right hemisphere of the brain. One scripture is not really enough Maybe even two isn't enough, but two gives us a little more uh, basis of uh, continuing with our thesis here. Page 505 in your little Bibles, and you go to the book of Psalms, and let's take a look at that and see if we come up with something else that strengthens us just a teeny bit. Psalm chapter 80, Psalm chapter 80 and verse 15, 
and we talk about the vineyard, which is, I guess, a form of a garden, you know, where things are growing and so forth, and the wine and plant. Psalm 80, 15, and the vineyard which your right hand has planted. Okay, so now we have two things that refer to a garden, I think, that are interesting because they both say that it's to the right side. One says it's planted with your right hand. The other says that it's eastward. So then if the beloved has gone to the garden, we have some right by browsing through the rest of the Bible to suggest to ourselves that the garden being referred to is this Eden garden, this love garden, this pleasureful garden of delights which is located at the right side of the right hemisphere of the brain. So then we could, by studying this thing, reach a, some kind of a conclusion or some kind of an idea that the beloved or God or the essence of God is located in the right hemisphere of the brain. Okay. Now, if we go back to where you were in page uh, six, uh, 576, back to the Song of Songs. It says here, he has gone to the beds of spices to feed in the gardens and gather lilies. It doesn't seem like, you know, kind of a guy that you'd want to hang around with or, you know, it doesn't seem like that interesting of a person. But anyhow, that's what it says. He's gone to the beds of spices, all right, down into the garden, and he's going to feed in the garden, and he's going to gather lilies. That spelled lilies. The two key words there are spices and lilies. The first thing that we understand as we're talking about the right hemisphere of the brain, we're, we're developing a thesis here. That we, you know, we're not proving anything. We're just trying to open and expand our ability to think and to try to make some sense out of out of scriptures, which is not an easy thing to do. But. Um, if, if we can get this far, now we, we come up with a couple of words and let's start to dissect words and see if they mean anything. Okay, this which is the divine energy located at the right hemisphere of the brain, two words, spices, okay, the beloved essence is spices, which metaphysically means purify, to purify, okay. There's, there's, one, there's one thing that happens, of course, when we go into meditation, we cast our energy to the right side, then there's a purification away from the negative thoughts of the mind. So the spices are to purify, and what do they purify us from? They purify us from fear, they purify us from anger, and they bring us peace, and lilies are a symbol of peace. So there's the two things, purification and peace. The energy that comes from the right side, that beautiful garden, which is the Garden of Eden, which I'm convinced is the right hemisphere of the brain, anyhow, right from the very beginning, that brings purification or purges away the thoughts, the negative and the violent thoughts from the left side, and brings us peace. Maybe it's only for that period of a half hour, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever your meditation is, but nonetheless, that is where you meet the one who is the beloved, that who is the Christ, and it purges away those, those fears and brings, brings us peace. We go to Song of Songs, chapter 6, and verse 3. In chapter 6, verse 3, it said, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. I am my beloved's, and my beloved's is mine. So here now we have the oneness that Jesus prayed about, that they all may be one. There is one. I am my beloved's, my beloved is mine. There is a oneness and there is an identification of a sameness between ourselves and God. There is, in other words, there is no difference. We had an interesting situation that occurred here during a meditation in which there was a movement of spirit and words to the effect that God had asked each person sitting in the meditation room to cup their hands and he would pour into their hands the warmth of his inner soul, the warmth of his inner life force, and that the person then would should put their hands up to their face, and they would feel the heat and the warmth. And I, and I walked out of here, you know, it was a blessing in a way, but I was concerned because I don't want to staging anything here or emotionally, you know, getting people involved in something that is, uh, you know, uh, emotional and, and not really the essence of, of spirit. And I prayed about it and thought about it within myself. And I think you stayed down and were counseling with somebody. I was home alone and I was doing this. And I said to spirit, nature, God, whatever word, I said, you know, I really am not 100% comfortable with what I heard down there because, I mean, after all, 
You know, if a person feels the warmth in their hands and it puts their hands up to their face, the heat that they're feeling is, it's, it's them, it's their own. And the answer comes back, that's it, exactly. The kingdom is within them. The energy has been poured, the heat, that which is the energy that pours forth is the very essence of themselves. What they are feeling, which is God's energy, is their energy. So I felt really good about that because I said, gosh, I know I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> and so I came out of that. And, you know, I really felt good because I had then a feeling that this made sense and it was kind of a confirmation that it confirmed Scripture without any of us knowing what had been said or what had been done and was starting to think more of in a little bit of charismatic things. Oh, you know, there's some entity in here pouring heat into people's hands and they're rubbing it on their face. And that sounded okay, but it sounded a little bit charismatic and um, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't really comfortable with whether something had been created. But then when I realized through that spirit moving back to me that that was exactly the point that was trying to be made, that this energy is your energy, this heat is your heat, which is God's. It is one. And so I am my beloved's, my beloved is mine. It is one. It is all one. God, ourselves, are one in a beautiful energy. And that, that is a very, very exciting thing. Okay. Now, we go to Song of Songs chapter 6 and verse 4. And in chapter 6, verse 4, it says, You are beautiful, O my love. We're talking now to the bridegroom. The bride, us, the spirit, is talking to the bridegroom, which is the Christ, God, whomever you want to talk about. Okay. You are beautiful, O my love, as Tirza. Tirza simply means pleasant. Okay. Quite a difference to identify God as pleasant. You know, the, more, the more I uh, study, and you know, sometimes I watch... Uh, you know, television, religious television, you know, Christian, well, the only religious television on really is Christian television. And I, I turned on Trinity Broadcasting the other night. It was just for a few minutes. And as I turned it on, there, a, a bomb exploded, and then the next thing was Jesus laying on the ground with thorns in his head and blood coming out and people slamming nails, and then another bomb exploded. And I'm, you know, I turned the dial, I turned the dial. What? I don't like, I, I will not sit for 10 seconds to watch a violent movie on television. I will not watch it. I mean, you know, <laughs> there is no redeeming values in watching people's heads get blown off. In the old days, Jimmy Cagney would say, all right, you guys need shooting. You wouldn't really, really see anything. You know, you get away. But even so, the violence, the violence perpetuates it, and we grow with it. Thank God that the toy makers are taking guns off the shelves for Christmas and all this kind of stuff. But you turn on Christian television, that's all that's on there is violence and, and predictions of violence. That's the culmination of their kingdom, is God is going to destroy this magnificent creation. And it, it, it just doesn't make any sense. And so when I get into this and I say, what is God referred to? Lilies and spices and pleasantness. That's not, that's not what's portrayed on these television shows, whatever they are. And it says, comely as Jerusalem. Comely means good looking. There's a beauty of perception, you know, designing, uh, uh, confirming divine consciousness. Comely means a beautiful, a beautiful looking as Jerusalem. We're not talking about Jerusalem, which is over in Palestine, because there's nothing beautiful about it. It's a nasty place. You can get <laughs> shot and killed over there as quick as they look at it. That's what we're not talking We're talking about Jerusalem which is described in Galatians 24, Galatians 4, 25, Jerusalem, which is above is free and is the mother of us all. So we have a portrait there, but what's the portrait about? It's not about Jesus. It's not about a God somewhere. It's about that beautiful essence within you that is waiting to express itself. It is an essence within you that is not looking to express itself through anger or fear or guilt or violence. It is an essence within you looking to... Uh, express itself through the pure aspects of peace and pleasantness and love. And, and, and that, to me, is, is extremely encouraging, and that is, to me, what, what quote-unquote, this thing we call God has to be about. Now we go right on. You know what I'm doing? <laughs> I'm skipping around in this book trying to find uh, the Song of Songs in, in my Bible here. Is anybody, what page is it on in there? <laughs> 
Oh, all right. Well, then I know where it is. God. Oh, yeah, here it is. Very, very good. Here. Song of Songs, Chapter 6. Now, here we've gotten to the point of we've got peace, and we've got purity, and we've got lilies, and we've got pleasantness. I mean, this is nice. This is kind of what I want to be. God, I don't want to get in touch with a guy with the army getting in the atomic bombs and people in hell and crucifying people. And I can't even believe. Can you believe? Where did this come from? Do you know what, Albert? They've taken an astronomical myth and made it into a religious foundation for their whole soul. Somebody came to me this morning. I believe it was Lorraine. And she had a track that was given out by kids who came to her house Halloween, a little track. You know what the track said on the last page? Jesus Christ came to save us worthless, guilty sinners. Now here's a little kid, a little kid dressed in his little whatever suit, and he's handing out a track telling people he is a worthless, guilty sinner. That's, I'm sorry. That is not, you know, and, and you know what's so sick about it? It comes out of the hands of people who portray themselves as Christians and followers of Christ. And Jesus Christ didn't say you're a worthless, guilty sinner. He said the kingdom of God is within you. He said you are the light of the world. He says the things that he did, you could do better than him. That doesn't sound like worthless, guilty sinners. But we just have created this monster and it is so out of control. We were talking today at lunch. What do you do? You know, I st the only thing that I hope is that the fundamental movement of all religions, fundamentalism, will finally be touched by this great power which is touching people all over the world. And they'll suddenly use the fundamentalism to become enlightened and then adapt the philosophies of the Apostle Paul. Okay, you've seen these things as symbols, now move on to perfection and start practicing what they truly mean. Maybe that'll happen. It, it, it will take a cosmic thing. Certainly we can't do it. But I, I, I really, I am so happy about being a part of this. I'm so happy at the turn of recent events where we're bringing it back I think it was, I think Bill Schultz put it so aptly at that meeting that we had. He said, let's get back to basics. To bring it back to just the point of seeking, what do we have to seek? Anything other than the essence of God, whatever God is, and the beauty of nature. And I'm just so happy to be a part of it and that there's nothing distracting us from that. And none of this, uh, you know, nothing, and especially the violence. But we get into Song of Songs, chapter 6 and, and verse 4, we're going to do a little different thing. You are beautiful, my love, as turns out calmly as Jerusalem. But then it says, terrible as an army with banners. Oh, here we go. Sounds like, uh, you know, we were talking this morning. And, you know, it came to me. I said, God, this terrible thing that occurred in South Carolina. And this mother that killed these two little babies in a car, drowning them in a car. Horrible. And, of course, which is good and which is true, you know, people are just absolutely outraged about this thing. It's a, a horrible thing to, to see anyone kill children, especially their mother. But on the other hand, what did, we, what, what did we think about it? What did we come up with? The fact that here we have, at the same time, politicians, we might have a president of the United States, we might have a king, we might have a government that'll dispatch planes over a town, drop bombs, and kill thousands of little babies. Kill thousands of little boys and girls. And what do you do? Do you outrage yourself? No. You march in a parade. And you wave a flag and you celebrate. We won. We won. And all of the babies are being buried and all of the little boys, and we don't care. So the point is it depends who's doing the killing. If we approve on the killer, then it's okay. If we don't approve of the killer, we're outraged. But if we approve of the killer, everything's okay. So we've got a, we've got a kind of a warped sense of value too. And that comes from this problem of being divided, you know. That side is wrong, this side is right, and religion is up to that division, up to their next. Terrible as an army with banners. Okay, this is the good part. Look at that word terrible. Terrible means to us, that's <laughs> awful. That's not what that word means. That word means awesome. That word means awesome. I mean, this means, wow, this is, uh, this is some heavy-duty stuff. This is, a, this is a power. So look at what we have here. 
we have beauty, we have peace, we have love, we have all of this wonder within us, and there we find that contained within that beauty, contained within that peace, contained within that love, which is our beloved at the right hemisphere of the brain, is an awesome power. Yeah. We've seen it recently. Haven't we seen it recently? Martin Luther King was a perfect example of it. Awesome power contained, and the man never, never, never made a fist. Never made a fist, but he was filled with awesome power. And had every Army, National Guard, uh, police department, state troopers, and everybody put together. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Martin down for the count. And, 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 uh, but of course, you know, and what, I'm going to get into this now, but he was a reincarnation of Moses. Whether, I don't know if anybody knows that, but I'm going to get into that. If you want to... If you want to know about that, send us self-addressed. Well, we'll discuss that Sunday morning. Put that down. That'll be a good uh, Sunday morning discussion. That's an interesting thing. There's no doubt who he was. No doubt in my mind whatsoever that he was a reincarnation of Moses. Okay, but here is the uh, uh, terrible as an army with banners. The banners, the banners that were carried, or the banners that were carried by the twelve tribes, and represent the twelve signs of the zodiac. And this now encompasses the power of the universe. So, so peace and love and gentleness and lilies and all of these very soft things provide a power. This beauty is an awesome power of good that identifies with the human psyche. It is not a power of violence. It is not a power of killing. It is not a power of crucifixion. It is not a power of blood and guts. It is not a power of Armageddon. It is a power of lilies. It is a power of gentleness. It is a power of peace. It is a power of love. But it is an awesome power. And what it does is it destroys evil. And it is located in the pleasant garden within us, located at the right side. That's neat. That is good. Now here's an interesting one. So, so, so it's chapter 6, verse 5. Um, and she says, turn away your eyes from me, for they have overcome me. Well, that sounds like a Betty Davis movie or all. <laughs> you know what I was saying? Oh, don't look at me because, oh, I'm just all titillated all over. R.J. Campbell says, self-consciousness is the eye of the soul. To come to grips with our own existence. Do you know what's being said there? People to this day cannot deal with the fact that they are God. Can't deal with it. Oh, turn away from me. Turn, don't. Oh, I'm not worthy. You know, we used to sing a song when I was in church. Oh, Lord, I am not worthy. That, you know, you know, when you say, I am not worthy, and you're a little child, you know what you're doing? You're putting negative damaging suggestions of worthlessness into your head. You're telling yourself you're not worthy. And that's a self-fulfilling prophecy because as you get older, unless somehow you snap out of it, that's the way you start acting your life. And you used to sing that all the time. Oh, Lord, I am not worthy. Just exactly the opposite of what God said. And so here's she, here... We saying, oh, turn your eyes away from me. You know, I can't, uh, you know, they're overcoming me. Well, I'm not worthy, you know. I'm just being consumed within your, but it's indeed sometimes overwhelming to deal with the truth that this whole proposition is our self. Our own self. You're looking at God. But you have to look into a mirror and see the radiance of God blossoming. This is you. There is no other place. Where is it? I would, I, look, I'll tell you what, if God is, I would give him, how much do we have? I would give him $1,000 if he just peak. There's no, because they're all over the place. This is the, do you realize what happens? What happens if everyone discovers their beloved in the garden within themselves? What happens? Then there is massive, awesome power let loose on the earth that heals and feeds the children, and raises up the animals, and cares for nature, and makes the planet Earth into the planet Heaven. The planet Earth, and all of its diseases, and all of its violence, would be turned into the planet Heaven of everlasting life and beauty, simply by the change of the vibratory power of negativity becoming a vibratory power of positive Christ consciousness. That's simple. That's simple. All of the fighting, all of this would stop. All it requires is renewed minds. 
I mean, think of it. You know what the conditions of the minds are out there. Now take a look at the world. Now what happens if all of the minds change? Or if at least the overwhelming majority of people in the minds change? The whole aspect of life changes. The whole aspect of the world changes. Now, let's get on because there are some interesting things. We don't want to keep you because I know you're very tired and had a heavy day. Song of Songs, chapter 6, verse 5. Your hair, sweet Ethel, is as a flock of goats that appear from Gilead. Did Albert ever say that to you? <laughs> oh, Ethel, please be mine because your hair is like a flock of goats. What do you think? You know, you know, this, you know, you know it's interesting. It, what the sad part about this is that, that I know people that have Bible studies read this stuff. Uh, Albert, it's your turn to read. How about reading us uh, the next paragraph, Albert? Your hair is like a flock of goats. Okay. Flock of goats. That sounds nice. Uh, how about your turn, Lynn? You want to read the next one? Yeah. They really believe his hair is like a flock of goats that appear from Gilead. Well, there should be something in Gilead that gives you an idea why the goats are involved. Do you know what the word Gilead means? It means the hill of testimony. Gilead is the hill of testimony. The hair is a flock of... Now, the goats, in this case, represent the higher self. They climb upward. So the goats are those which are the mountain goats that climb upward to the hill, which is the mountain of testimony, where we are able to give witness to the actual existence of that which is God. And so then, the phrase given to God is that your hair or that which grows at the highest is like the goats that which climbs up into the higher realms of consciousness that come from the Mount of Gilead, that is the hill of testimony, the place where we can give testimony and we can give reference to that which is the existence of God who dwells within us. See? That, I mean, there's a, there's, there's a reason why the word goats are in there. There's a reason why the word Gilead is in there. And when you put the two together, you get a description of, of what it is that's being conveyed to us. In the higher realm, in the mountain of our own minds, there is a place where we can find the truth that we can give witness to others about the true existence of this thing we call God. I'm going to do this on Sunday morning, too. So. The hair which grows out of the head of a Nazarene was used in, by some Nazarenes to symbolize spirit, spiritual growth. What was it that did Samson in? What did Delilah do to Samson? <coughs> well, that was good, but it's not good enough, Ethel. But it's close. I want you to look at this because it's interesting. And as soon as you see it, you'll understand. Okay? And it's worthwhile looking at. Go to Book of Judges. Go to page 226 in those little Bibles. But the rest of you go to Book of Judges, chapter 16. Judges, chapter 16. And look at verse 19. And what did Delilah do? She made him sleep upon her knee. She called for a man. And she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. She caused to shave off the seven locks of his head. She, in this particular instance, represent the human emotions which cuts away the power of that seven chakra or seven nerve systems or the power of seven which rises up the spine. The emotions cut away that which flows through the spine. The emotions cut away that which is the power of the seven steps to the pineal. And therefore, once that is cut away, then we are powerless. And what happens to Samson? He becomes blind. He can no longer see the things that he used to see. Why? Because he lost the seven. How did he lose the seven? The emotions cut the seven away. Say that? 
Or otherwise, do you want to believe that there was a man running around with long hair and his girlfriend cut his hair and all of a sudden, you know, he became very weak? Well, that's silly. That doesn't happen. And why were there seven locks? There were seven locks because that symbolizes the seven chakras, the seven nerve centers of the spine. And those things are done in and cut away by that which is the focus of the emotional nature. It's the same thing we were talking about this morning. You walk on the water when you raise yourself to the second level of consciousness, but you drown in that very same water when you look down back to the earth, down to the bottom, back to the lower aspects of the mind, you drown. So here then we talk about the hair, and let's get on now to the next comparison of our beautiful looking beloved. We got to his hair, and now we'll get to his teeth. Song of Songs, chapter 6, verse 6, your teeth. Albert, as Ethel would say, I remember that. she wrote you this letter, Albert. She says, Dear Albert, I don't know if anybody's ever told you this, but I love you so much because your teeth are as a flock of sheep which come up from the washing. Ah, <laughs> oh, brother. I have to do this at night when there's not too many people here because I can hear this, you know, they'd be falling out of their chairs, you know. Why teeth? Why do you think teeth would be important to compare with the beloved, the Christ consciousness? What are teeth? They represent that part of us which allow us to chew, to consume. In other words, they represent this aspect of our nature that causes us to consider to weigh the cost. Before we swallow, before we digest, we chew something over. You even say it in some of your symbolic languages. Say, let's chew the fat. Let's you know, chew the fat or let's chew this over. Let's, let's you know, see this. So, you know, I don't think I can swallow that. You know? And so teeth represent those aspects of our nature compared to sheep, our spiritual impulses, divine thoughts. Okay? And basically what's being said here is that your meditational process becomes in the same way as you use the teeth in your mouth to make sure that things are chewed or considered thoroughly before you swallow them. Huh? You don't just react, knee-jerk, shoot from the hip. You go into meditation and you allow that which is the spirit to start to weigh the things in the balance at the right side, and then when you come out of your meditation, you look as to what are the conditions that are facing you now. How have they changed? So rather than just making a knee-jerk reaction or saying, yes, this is the way I will do something. You know, I have, a, I have an interesting thing. We had some uh, psychological tests done in our company uh, in training and so forth, and I had, you know, this is Briggs test. And I had four letters attached to my personality, and it identified something that is very frustrating to a lot of people in business, as far as I am with me, and that is when I am asked a question, I, in, I am incapable of giving an answer. I cannot answer until I have time. Somebody asks me a question, they'll ask another person the same question, they'll get the answer right over the phone. Some of the big shots, you know, in the company, they call up and they get Bill Donnie on the phone. What do you think? I, I, I get a blank. I get a blank. I can't even answer. I can't, I get, my mind goes blank. As soon as I hang up the phone, I sit for 10 seconds and stare, and I know the answer. I'll call you back. Oh. <laughs> See? In fact, you know, Kim, Allen, <laughs> Kim Allen used to say, I used to get so frustrated with you until Rich Petrino pointed to me and said, you're a person that has tremendous logic and really comes forth with good decisions, but you can't make them like that. Exactly. Doesn't make any difference. What the, <laughs> you can't change that. It's built into the psyche. It's built into the nature. So you talk about teeth here. Basically what's being conveyed is that there is a need before a person swallows anything from anybody else for you to chew that over and make sure of what you've got inside of you before you swallow it. Right. So that's why, the word, that's why the teeth are used in comparison 
to a spiritual aspect. And that's what you've got in the Song of Songs. In the Song of Songs, you're comparing different parts of the human body allegorically to represent parts of the psyche and parts of the emotional and system of consciousness. Okay? Now, the, the teeth are like a flock of sheep which go up from the washing. All right? That's important, too. The sheep and the washing. All right. and, and, and without kind of understanding some of the characteristics, see, what this is here is basically a, a hidden or dark sayings that were consistent with the time that this was written, okay, where you might use, I can't think of any phrases right now that, uh, well, for instance, there's a football player who used to play with Notre Dame. I don't know who he plays with now. His name is Rocket Ishmael. Well, the word rocket would be totally foreign here to the people of thousands of years ago. You couldn't use that word to describe a person as being a very fast runner. But you can use it today because we know what rockets are and we know how fast they go. So if we wanted to say this person is a fast runner, we, so we, we call them rocket. Well, in here they talk the sheep washing, see? And what the sheep washing is, the washing is the river or the stream where the sh sheep drink from. Basically, it is the water. Now, sheep are thoughts. And thoughts that come from the water are exactly what we were talking about this afternoon of Jesus walking on the water. It is the second stage of consciousness. So then when we're into meditation, we enter meditation, our conscious level lifts from the first stage to the second stage, which is water. And then the thoughts, which are the sheep, okay, that came up from the washing, raising themselves up to higher realms, provide that point where we can start seeing things in a different light. We can start digesting things. We can start taking things into ourselves a little slower so that eventually we can make decisions that are more right with our life and what we're trying to accomplish or what God's trying to accomplish us, through us. So the teeth are compared to the sheep that come up from the washing because the sheep that come up from the washing represent thoughts that come out of the second stage of consciousness or water. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Do you have any questions? Do you understand what I'm talking about? Okay. And, 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 and so then the thoughts that come from the second stage of, the, of consciousness serve to do what? They serve to give us time through the electronics that activate within the brain at that point so that decisions can be made by us that are much more rational than we would make otherwise if we had not taken the meditation time. So that's good. So let's, let, we'll continue. We're, we're almost done here. In, in Song of Songs, chapter 6, verse 6, it says, Everyone, it's talking about these thoughts, everyone bears twins, and there is not one barren among them. Everyone bears twins, and there is not one barren within them. What does that just say? Well, every what? Every thought. Every thought. Twins. There is, within all of nature and all that is God, there is a duality. What is it saying? Why are you chewing this over? You're going to see the negative aspects of that. You're going to see the positive aspects. There's a not, it's not going to come saying, oh, this is wonderful. It's going to say to you, well, this is wonderful, but... Okay? Everyone bears twins. But there's not a barren one among them. It will give life. So what, is it, you see, what is available inside the human mind? And, and we're just, and you're just, you know, this is very adult stuff to be talking about in church, isn't it? But not so adult that we can't grasp it instantly. There's nobody in here having any trouble understanding this. Yes. You want to stand up so that they... <laughs> The duality that you're talking about, I use that a lot in counseling that, you know, you can, like, p point out if you're discussing a situation, okay, now this is the good aspects of it, and this is the negative aspects of it, and it's important that you see both aspects for weighing anything, because then that, that brings you into, then, a complete picture and then into a, you know, like a wholeness with mm -hmm. what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, we do the knee-jerk Mm -hmm. and, and either from a negative or a positive pole, but it's the yin and the yang, and, and, and it's life. Mm -hmm. It's that circle. Uh, that's, that's a good point, and when you talk about, I, uh, I talked about Rich Petrino, who's a psychologist with our company, who I owe a lot to this man. He's an 
an excellent man. I, I was talking, in fact, I was talking to uh, Mike, who was our boss and my vice president of our company, and I was telling him about Rich, and uh, I remember when I was transferred out of the job and I went into a kind of a depression, uh, I was really down. I didn't know where I was going to go and what I was going to do, and I thought they were kind of running me out towards the door. And I think this is important for people. Don't minimize sometimes the wonders that a good psychologist, I mean, somebody that's really good can do for you. Um, this man is a really fine man who, maybe I'm prejudiced because he listens to Kataro and all of this stuff when he meditates and so forth. But he looked at me and he cut his finger close up to me and says, hey, you've been doing that job for 21 years. Whatever this new job is, don't let anybody tell you what to do. You create it. You make the need. You put it together. You create it. And I walked out of there and I said, what should I do? And, and then I thought to myself, what does this company need? And, and, and these cable companies are under tremendous scrutiny from the federal and state governments about their uh, rules and regulations and their reports. And I said, you know, there's nobody going around and checking to make sure that all of these things are done. I'll do that. So I just did. And I've created this. <laughs> and I've got another guy in there with me now. We're forming a department. I'm working out of my house. And like this uh, boss told me uh, Friday, he says, you've become a VIP with all of these people because they want you to come and make sure all of their stuff is right. And, but I needed somebody that I really had tremendous respect for because, first of all, I know he's deep into meditation, so I respect that. He's... He's a, he's a very skilled person. He's a very nice, gentle type of man. And he said, just what I had to hear. And it sparked me to go and, and do this, you see? So I wasn't capable at that point of doing it by myself. But on the other hand, probably the Tuesday night prior to this, in my meditation, the, the sheep were coming up from the washing, from the water. And what had then came was nature put together a situation for me, and Rich just happened to be at that place that I went that day. I haven't seen him since, <laughs> but he was there that day. Now, you talk about doing these types of things or looking deep into things. When one of the things Rich talks about is the why, the psychological question why. And it was just like where we have this Susan Smith who allegedly killed her children. Then you could say, for instance, why did the children die? Because the mother killed them. Why did the mother kill them? Because she lost her mind, whatever. Why did she lose her mind? Because she was surrounded with all of these problems. Why was she surrounded with problems? Because she was getting a divorce. Why was she getting a divorce? Because she was seeing another guy or whatever. Why was she seeing another? And you trace this thing all the way back with whys, and you find out, like Buddha, all of the causes that led up to this terrible effect. So, you know, it's all in, 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 in the mind, and it's all in understanding how the mind but we're not psychologists or we're not psychiatrists, we don't have to be. We have to be trusting that the scriptures are telling us that there is something within us that will carry us into a new plane. But the one thing I think we can see quite clearly is that religion as we know it has been placing thoughts into people that are violent and fearful and separative and certainly can have nothing to do with God. Now, so we learned about this then, about the twins, the duality that we were talking about, that both sides of the story will be presented to us, but they will not be barren. If we are listening and we are doing in our meditation, these things will bear fruit. And it says in, in Song of Songs, chapter 6, verse 7, as a piece of pomegranate, and I want you to look at something. This is what I love, because we talk about the temple. When we say God lives in a temple not made with hands. And the only temples on the face of the earth that are not made of hands are those that are on the sides of your head, which is indicative of the fact that that which is the temple of God is in the human head, in human consciousness, in the human mind. So it says then in Song of Songs, chapter 6, uh, verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 7, as a piece of pomegranate, okay, the seeds, the pomegranate is loaded with seeds. And what it's saying that 
these seeds then that, that are, 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 are going to sprout and pr give us fruit, these seeds that are going to grow within us. And this is the line I want you to listen to, and I want you to listen to it very carefully, okay? As a piece of pomegranate are thy temples within your locks hair. See? In other words, the seeds of life, the seeds of peace, the seeds of solution, the seeds of healing, the seeds of love, the seeds of nature are where? In the temples that are covered by our hair. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that wonderful to see that? It doesn't even leave you with any question anymore. The ideas that come bursting forth are like the seeds in the pomegranate. There's so many of them, and they are located right there in the temples that are covered by your hair, right there in your head. It's in the book. It's in the books in the Bible. This is, when, you, when, you, when you look at this stuff, see, I have an advantage, and I understand this, and I'm very grateful to it for it to be able to share it with you. I have an advantage, but what, can you imagine how I feel when I read this stuff and see this? Because with me, I, it just, I can understand it. I mean, it, it, you know, it just happens right away. It's very exciting. And, uh, yeah. Then, when we see that, let me read it once, 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 once again, because it's so interesting. As a piece of a pomegranate are thy temples within thy locks, the temples that are covered by your hair. And then in Mark 14, 58, Jesus said, Destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. And that's the temple God lives in. That's your head. So the multitudes or seeds are planted within the temple of the human head, human consciousness. We did a few verses in the Song of Solomon, chapter 6. And we got the rest of 6, chapter 7, and chapter 8 to go, and, and we will have done that. But I think that's pretty, pretty exciting and pretty nice stuff. So we had a good day. We did Exodus. We completed the book of Exodus. And we'll do some interesting things on Sunday morning as we explore some of these things and, and uh, talk a little bit and uh, try something new. But thank you for sharing this time with us on TV. And we'll see you a bit. Bye-bye.